To give an idea of where we left off uh, on the previous lecture, we had finished up with uh, our, uh, our nomenclature of alkenes, specifically bringing into context our geometric isomers, cis and trans, potentially uh, being within the name. And we had gone through a number of examples of that. From there, we had gone into uh, actual chemical reactions involving uh, alkenes, uh, specifically addition reactions of alkenes in which we have a reagent uh, which is distributed over our carbon-carbon double bond to become a carbon-carbon single bond. And we had looked at two examples um, which involved what are called symmetrical reagents. See our, our reagent here, A and B have to be the same thing, like two hydrogens or two chlorines or uh, two, uh, two bromines or that sort of thing. It's symmetrical. You know, what's on one side is on the other. Um, so uh, the first one we looked at was hydrogenation reaction, that addition reaction of an alkene where uh, molecular hydrogen is added over a double bond to become a single bond. Uh, and uh, also we looked at the halogenation of an alkene or an alkyne uh, in which uh, either molecular chlorine or molecular bromine were added over that, uh, that, that double bond to become a dihalide. So what we'll be looking at now are, uh, we'll continue on with addition reactions to uh, mainly alkenes, um, but this time the, uh, the reagent is going to be an unsymmetrical reagent, where um, as we saw before, we had this uh, covalent bond, and in the next two examples, what is on either side of the covalent bond is going to be different. In this case, we have a hydrogen on one side and an OH on the other. Um, so that, that's going to sort of uh, work, uh, work to show as an example of unsymmetrical reagents. And we're going to start this on what is called the hydration of an alkene. As before, the name of the addition reaction gives us some insight into what the reagent is. And the hydration, we think of a hydro or water. And indeed, water is the, uh, the reagent. We have H2O uh, as a reagent. Um, I'm showing it in this suggestive fashion as HOH. Nobody ever really uh, displays water like that, but it's to show that this we have this covalent bond with a hydrogen on one side and an OH on the other. Um, conditions for this particular reaction um, are catalytic acidic conditions. We see this as catalytic H plus frequently, that H plus uh, be, meaning that there is a higher degree of, a, there's a small amount of acid in the water or in the solution. It is low pH in, in, uh, and uh, uh, under these conditions, we have a functional group interconversion, in this case from an alkene into an alcohol. And we're going to see ultimately how this works. This over on the left-hand side is clearly an alkene. We have a carbon-carbon double bond. And if we look over on the, uh, the right-hand side on the product profile, we have an alcohol, which is um, our OH, which is covalently attached to a hydrocarbon type carbon. By definition, that is the structure of an alcohol. So when we treat an alkene with water, we get uh, our alcohol. So let's look at a potential example of the hydration of an alkene. Here we have uh, again, playing our favorite game, what's in the box? We have an alkene plus H2O goes with catalytic, uh, hydrog hyd uh, catalytic uh, hydrogen ion or acid over the arrow. Uh, that is all diagnostic for the hydration of an alkene. And how we would approach this, notice this uh, H2O, I have not written it suggestively. Indeed, most of the time you wouldn't see it as HOH, but we can, uh, we can set this up such that we can we can uh, place that HOH over that alkene. So first, let's take a look at what that, that uh, business end of that molecule is, that alkene, and we'll draw just that portion in complete bonding uh, structure right here, showing the carbons and the hydrogens that are assumed to be connected to them. And we are ultimately what happens, as goes on in our other uh, addition reactions, is that that water in the form of HOH lies down on that double bond uh, with hydrogen going to one carbon and OH going to the other carbon, that adjacent one, 
and we would get that double bond going down to a single bond. And let's take color coded, let's take a look at what we ultimately get out of this. So this is uh, how, what would come out of this. This is still sort of a, a hodgepodge, if you will, of different types of drawing. We have some line structure, some complete bonding structure, but if we drew this product, this alcohol product in line structure, well, this is what we would get. Um, ultimately, it looks a little different because the OHs are pointing different ways. That doesn't matter. These are all carbon-carbon single bonds, and we can rotate that OH around any, anywhere we want as long as it's on that third carbon in as we've drawn this. And uh, uh, again, since we've gone back to completely line structure, um, we take away all the, the carbons, we take away the hydrogens that are assumed to, and their bonds assumed to be connected to it. You know, and you don't have to draw it in, in line structure. You could stay with the structure before. That's a little bit more unusual. But if you were to draw this as a uh, as, as the, the answer to it, I, I would not have a problem uh, with either one being the, uh, be, be, however, which way you wanted to uh, express that. Looking at a couple of other examples, we can see that when we play what's in the box, uh, that box is not always the product. Sometimes we can, it can be the reagent. Sometimes the box is asking what the starting material was. Sometimes even that box could be over the arrow uh, asking you what the conditions would be for this reaction. So we have a couple of examples of what's in the box here. Uh, the one on top here, we have this uh, cyclic alkene plus something with catalytic, uh, hydro, uh, catalytic H plus over the arrow. Uh, and we end up with an alcohol. So we would have to, again, be sleuths and uh, diagnose this as uh, we have, this is an, uh, an alkene going to an alcohol uh, under catalytic acidic conditions. So in this case, we'd have to remember that, okay, the, that, that reagent must be water. I'm just throwing water into the, uh, into the box there would settle that particular example. Uh, the example on the bottom, we have something plus water under catalytic acidic conditions go to that particular alcohol product, which we see over on the right. So again, we would have to we'd be able to analyze this and say unequivocally, this must be a, uh, the, a hydration of an alkene because we have an alcohol product. Water is indeed the reagent under catalytic acidic conditions. It all adds up to that. So we would uh, be able to say that well, what would be the original uh, alkene starting material? So the, where would that HOH add over? And we'd have to say that we, we have these two carbons right here. Uh, we have, we're showing that OH on one side, but on the other side, we could indeed, it does indeed exist, or we could put that that, that hydrogen is there. In line drawing, remember, we don't show that hydrogen, so it is still there, but we're not uh, showing that. So uh, uh, the, the, an the answer over on the left-hand side would be this particular alkene uh, and showing where the, the alkene where the, between the two carbons that we had looked at before um, would have to be uh, where that double bond was. Now, just to bring in something we looked at in the previous lecture, we could put another compound in here as a starting material. It would still be in that alkene between those two, uh, two carbon atoms, that double bond. But uh, if you'll notice in the, what we have right here in front of us, that is the trans uh, uh, alkene. We could also put the cis alkene in there. Remember, we, those are two different compounds. One cannot rotate into the other because we don't have the ability to rotate around double bonds. Those are two different compounds. However, if either of those were treated with, uh, with water under catalytic acidic conditions, they would both give the exact same uh, compound as product as shown here. So for this hydration uh, uh, reaction, addition reaction, we've shown examples almost exclusively or exclusively with alkenes, carbon-carbon double bond. But there's another unsaturated species we're sort of bringing along with this. Um, what about alkynes, carbon-carbon uh, triple bonds? What about the hydration of an alkyne as we see here? Uh, over on the left-hand side, we see a representative alkyne plus water under catalytic acidic conditions. And in this case, 
this does not fit the, uh, the, the usual bill we might think. This is actually an exception reaction. So I tend to shy away from exception reactions a little bit because they can sometimes confuse more than enlighten. However, this uh, hydration of an alkyne is something that is seen frequently, so I do need to uh, think about going over it. Let's think about what what is happening when we put we would distribute water HOH over a carbon carbon double bond that we just saw before over an alkene well H goes on one side of uh, uh, OH goes on the other side and that carbon carbon double bond goes down to a carbon carbon single bond well the same can be said for uh, for an alkyne as a general sense we could have HOH water adding over that triple bond and it would lose a multiple bond to go down to a double bond. Indeed, that is what happens uh, uh, initially. However, this is an unstable structure. It's unstable. Um, it's called an enol intermediate. And if we think about it, uh, that it's sort of a contraction of the fact that in this intermediate, we have an alkene, and we have an alcohol. So they call it, this general structure is known as an enol structure. Uh, suffice to say that this is a, an unstable species. So what we get is a spontaneous rearrangement that does not really flow with uh, what we've looked at before, uh, uh, at least uh, with respect to this addition reaction. Um, we shuffle the double bond and we shuffle around a hydrogen in order to give uh, a, a ketone intermediate. We have this spontaneous rearrangement to this, uh, to this species, which is known uh, as a type of structure, is a ketone. In a ketone, we have uh, a, a carbonyl carbon, and on either side of that carbonyl carbon, we have hydrocarbon type carbon. So that, uh, so that is diagnostic ketone structure. And if you look at what exactly went on here, we had, if you look over on the left-hand side, that double bond migrated up to uh, between the carbon and the oxygen to give a carbon-oxygen double bond. And that hydrogen that was attached to the oxygen then goes and is uh, rearranged to sit on that carbon. Again, that's kind of confusing, and it's a reason I don't necessarily like to, uh, to, 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 to show this, but this is indeed what happens when we hydrate an alkyne. So if you see an alkyne with, treated with water under catalytic acidic conditions, you're going to get uh, this spontaneous rearrangement to the, a ketone structure. It will form a ketone. Shown in line structure, uh, this is what that would look like. Again, uh, it looks very different, you know, that this very different uh, from this sort of halfway complete bonding structure and halfway between a condensed structure. Um, they're the same compound. It is going to be important that we that we look that we look at these and uh, and are able to recognize that well I've just drawn two different representations of the same compound. So our next example of the uh, of an addition reaction of an unsymmetrical reagent to an alkene is what is called the hydrohalogenation of an alkene. That's kind of a mouthful. But if we think about it, um, uh, hydro is sort of contracted for hydrogen, and halogen is a halogen. Hi a hydrohalogen would be H on one side of that, uh, that covalent bond, which we see here, and on the other side is a halogen, um, either chlorine or bromine. Again, remember, we're constrained with our halogens to be either chlorine or bromine. So what is it exactly that, that we're treating with? Well, either uh, uh, hydrochloric acid or hydrobromic acid, strong acids. We're, so we're just treating that alkene with a strong acid, either HCl or HBr. So now look over the arrow here. What do we have? Well, we have nothing. So uh, this, uh, when we have nothing over the arrow, no conditions or, or special uh, uh, things that need to, to go on, heat or light or catalytic acidic conditions or whatever, that means that the reaction is spontaneous. It's a spontaneous reaction uh, when we have nothing shown over the, the arrow. So the, the reaction proceeds spontaneously. 
So when we treat that uh, alkene with HCl or HBr, what we get is that functional group interconversion from an alkene to a halide, a, sing a single halide. So that is the, the functional group interconversion. And uh, from that, uh, we have, in a general nutshell, uh, what the uh, hydrohalogenation of an alkene produces. So let's look at an example. Um, here is an alkene, an alkene that we have here, plus HCl. Fair enough, that's, uh, that, that's the reagent. Nothing over the arrow, so it says it's spontaneous. All of these sort of uh, uh, fit the bill of what we uh, of the hydrohalogenation of an alkene. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's, as we did before, enunciate that uh, that carbon carbon double bond that alkene into just a portion being in complete bonding structure and we're going to lay down like much as we did water h o h we're going to lay down h c l over that carbon carbon double bond and it is going to go to a carbon carbon single bond with the hydrogen from the h c l on one side and the chlorine from the h c l on the other side so this is indeed what we get that is one way, sort of a mixed bag way, of expressing the halide product that we get out of this reaction. If we brought distilled all this back down to line structure, what we would get would be this uh, structure right here. Again, looking very different from what we see below it, but there are two representations of exactly the same uh, compound. Again, we encounter a what's in the box sort of uh, example where the box is not necessarily uh, the product. In this case, it looks like we have it's the, the, the starting material in the, in the reaction is what's in the box. And we, so we have something plus HBr, hydrobromic acid, nothing over the arrow gives a halide. And we take all that information in and we think about it and we say, well, what, what must be the starting material then? All of that leads back to the hydrohalogenation of an alkene. So we have to have an alkene uh, starting material. How we would do this would, is we would trace out the, carbon, the single bonded carbon structure of what we see in the, the product and put it into, or at least start us into the, uh, into the box asking for the starting material and just put a carbon-carbon double bond, an alkene between two of the adjacent carbons. And I've chosen uh, this carbon and this carbon right here. It doesn't have to be. I can put that alkene, I could put it right here, I could put it on top or anyway, between any two adjacent carbons on there. Notice they're all representations of that same compound. So this is, the, you know, you wouldn't have to be constrained only to have our alkene between these two carbons. They could be between any two adjacent carbons uh, on this starting material. So let's uh, th think about this one. This was uh, an example uh, that we looked at from, uh, from previous. And this, uh, we, we, I think we, we treated this uh, uh, product, or this, uh, sorry, this uh, alkene with water before. Now we're treating it with uh, HCl. And let's think about this uh, a, a minute here because th this is going to become important. Um, if we were to lay HCl down on this double bond, as we've done before, what, react what product would we get? Well, um, if, if we work this out as we've done before, we would end up with this product, where this written in line structure. So uh, the, where that uh, chlorine uh, is on the third carbon in on that hexane chain, 3-chlorohexane, if we were going to name it. But what about if we laid the HCl down, since it's an, a non-unsymmetrical reagent, the other way? Whereas notice we have now chlorine over on the other side and hydrogen over on the side that the chlorine was. What would that give us? Well, if we drew that line structure, we'd be given this line structure. Initially, these two compounds, well, they look a little different, but name them, name them, and they would both be 3-chlorohexane. Uh, they're both the chlorines. One of those, if we just flipped it over, would become the other one.
So up to this point, uh, we've, we've been working, we have the same compounds here, we've been working with uh, symmetrical alkenes. I've been very careful to have symmetrical alkenes in here as starting materials, so no matter which way that that unsymmetrical reagent lays down on it, we are going to get the same product as shown in the, the blue uh, box over on the right-hand side. So now let's, uh, let's think about what if we had an unsymmetrical alkene and we were going to start to uh, treat that with an unsymmetrical reagent. So this brings up uh, something known as Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule, and there's two tenets to Markovnikov's rule, and it's only specific for our purposes for the hydration or hydrohalogenation of unsymmetrical alkenes. And we'll look at examples of both. In the, in the case of, so if we look at our starting material here, what exactly do we have? We have an alkene, and it is unsymmetrical. It is not symmetrical like we saw before, and we're going to treat that with water under catalytic acidic conditions. It's a hydration of an alkene, but that alkene is unsymmetrical. Let's see what we get. Well, HOH can lay down in this manner on this uh, unsymmetrical alkene, giving us this product. Fair enough. HOH can also lay down on this unsymmetrical alkene backwards to the with respect to the previous one where now our OH is going for that central carbon in that three carbon chain and we would now get a different compound notice these are constitutional isomers they're two different compounds they're not renditions of the same compound which I can turn around or flip over um, clearly we have uh, we have in, that, in, in the first case we have the alcohol uh, 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 on the end carbon, and the second way of the alcohol on the central carbon. Those have different connectivity. So we form two different constitutional isomer products when we uh, either hydrate or hydrohalogenate in unsymmetrical alkene. But the other uh, predictive tenet of Markovnikov's rule is as follows. Of the two products, the more substituted product will be the major product, and the less substituted product will be the minor product. In this reaction, you cannot get away from the fact that you're gonna get a mixture of products. You're just, just gonna happen. However, we can predict which, is going, which of the two products is gonna be formed in the larger amount, and which is going to be in the smaller amount, the minor product. And uh, the way to do that is to, uh, to analyze our product profile. So this is, in, in a sense, uh, what we looked at uh, before, our two products of this hydration reaction of an alkene. Of course, this would be under catalytic acidic conditions. I didn't put these in here, but this is just to, to illustrate the two different products we have. So how to determine what is considered uh, more substituted or what is considered less substituted. First, we locate the carbon atom uh, bearing the substituent. In this case, it would be the, uh, the carbon bearing the alcohol group. There's, that's the carbon bearing the alcohol group in that uh, molecule. That's the carbon bearing the alcohol group in that molecule. So we've got to locate that carbon atom. Having done that, we count how many other carbon atoms is it directly attached to, right next door? Well, let's look at the top one. Well, we have a circle around the carbon that is directly connected to the alcohol, or the OH, and we notice that it has one carbon directly adjacent to it, directly attached to it, one. So it is considered singly substituted. Let's look at the other one. Well, we have a circle around that carbon that's directly attached to the alcohol or OH group. And notice that that carbon is directly attached to two other carbons. 
so it's doubly substituted. So the more substituted product is the major one. We can predict that using Markovnikov's rule. This product of the two would be formed in the greater amount. And the other one, the less substituted product, would be formed in a minor amount. So we have a predictive quality to this uh, uh, using Markovnikov's rule. All right, let's take a look at uh, how a potential what's in the box problem would be set up for this. Notice over on the left hand side, we have an alkene, happens to be an unsymmetrical alkene. We're treating this now with HCl, that's the uh, hydrohalogenation, another uh, unsymmetrical reagent. Again, notice nothing over the arrow. This tells us it's a spontaneous reaction. And look how I set up the product profile. I have two boxes now. In one is labeled as the major product, one labeled as the minor product. This is a great help, by the way, because already, okay, now we're thinking about uh, that rule that we worked with on this uh, hydrohalogenation of an alkene, Markovnikov's rule. We're thinking, okay, major minor product, that means we're looking for the product, product differentiation in the, uh, the, the substitution pattern uh, of the products. One's gonna be more substituted, one will be less substituted. So let's uh, look at this again from the standpoint of uh, how are we going to lay down on this uh, unsymmetrical alkene our unsymmetrical reagent? All right, well, HCl could lay down in the following fashion, uh, uh, where, where chlorine would now be attached to that, uh, that top carbon, so we would get that. Notice, again, I'm sort of mixing in uh, sort of complete bonding structure with line structure. Typically that's not done, but it's okay because we're just learning this. And I'm also using some color coding here. So we have a chlorine attached to that particular carbon in the product. But what if HCl laid down the other way where we had chlorine uh, attached to that uh, more congested carbon, if you will? Well, that would give uh, the following product right here, again, taking some license uh, um, halfway between complete bonding structure and line structure, but again, color coded as well. Those are two different compounds. They have different connectivity. Look at where those chlorines are attached to, two different carbon environments. So let's take a look at these now and try to figure out which is more substituted, which is less substituted. The one on the top, we, the circle sign signifies the carbon attached to that functional group, that halide. And we can see that we have one, two carbons directly attached to it. On the bottom, we have, uh, the, uh, the, we have the circled carbon to be the one that the chlorine is attached to. And notice right next door to it, we have one, two, three carbons. Oh, well, that would mean that this product on the bottom is more highly substituted than the other one, and thus it will be formed in, as in the greater amount. It is the major product. So again, I've taken some license and I've drawn this in complete line structure. Um, so we're omitting that, uh, that hydrogen that was adjacent to that uh, chlorine, but that's okay. That's a reasonable way to do it. We can predict that as the major product. Why? Because it is more highly substituted. So the other one, it is less substituted, but really it's the process of elimination that, this, uh, that the other one would be the minor product. It is indeed the one with the less, that is less substituted. Looking at another one, uh, it's good to have uh, more examples than less. Uh, so we have yet another alkene. Uh, in this case, we are hydrating that alkene. There's our alkene, there's our reagent, it's water, hydration, under catalytic acidic conditions. So those, uh, all of those fit that bill. We'd have to slowly bring ourselves to that. And know, okay, I recognize this is the hydration of an alkene. And looking over in the product profile, we now see major and minor product. Oh, Markovnikov's rule comes into play. So again, we'll look at this uh, kind of strange looking alkene, still exists, but it's sort of strange looking. Uh, and we're gonna lay down now, on this case, uh, water. Let's lay down water. 
uh, HOH on one side uh, to the other, and we're going to get this uh, this product where the uh, if we look at what what carbon is that OH attached to? Well, we see it as that carbon right there. Well, what happens if we lay down HOH on that particular unsymmetrical alkene in the opposite direction? So now we have that OH would form that more, would connect to that more congested carbon to give this product. And this would be the carbon that is directly connected to that OH group. So now we have to figure out, just as we did before, uh, the substitution pattern on, on both of these. Well, the major product would be the one in which our substitution pattern, here's our carbon directly on the bottom, directly connected to that OH, and we would see that we have three. One, two, three carbons that that is directly connected to. So that would be triply substituted if we kept that uh, in our mind. So there's three. We'll just write down the number three there. The other one is one in which we have, here's our carbon directly connected to the OH group. We find that that is only directly connected to one carbon. One carbon. So thus, this is singly substituted. Well, as we saw before, that triply substituted one goes as the major product. The other one, by really by process of elimination, goes as our minor product. So let's look at some of the limitations of Markovnikov's rule. Um, here we have an unsymmetrical alkene over on the left, HBr, hydrohalogenation, nothing over the arrow, it's spontaneous. So let's see what happens when we lay down HBr, that unsymmetrical reagent, onto that unsymmetrical alkene. Here we go. Here's the alkene. I'm going to put down HBr in this manner to give this product, or HBr in this manner, turned around, to give, I hope you will notice, that's a different product. It's different. That bromine is on a different carbon than uh, in each of those uh, uh, parent chains. Different products. Now, maybe you'll notice that on the product profile on top, I did not write down major and minor product in there. That is for a reason. It is because if we were to uh, uh, try to identify the substitution patterns on each of these, so I've just... Uh, highlighted the carbon directly attached to that uh, halide substituent, we would find that they're both connected to two other carbons. They're both doubly substituted. So we have our two products. They're different products, but they have the same degree of substitution. They're both doubly substituted. So in this case, we cannot predict a major and minor product out of this. One might exist, one might be major and one might be minor. The point is we cannot predict that using Markovnikov's rule. So let's look now at a different type of reaction of alkenes, a, a, a more practical application, if you will. And this is with respect to the synthesis of polymers, notably known as addition polymers. Now, a polymer is a chemical compound formed by repeating structural units known as monomers. So we, these monomers are molecules. We get a whole bunch of them together and we put it under conditions that allows for a covalent bond to form between each of these monomers, making for very, very large molecules on the order of molar masses, but you know, of 100,000, 500,000, or a million grams per mole. These are gigantic. Uh, molecules which are used uh, notably uh, uh, in material chemistry. Now what ties this back into uh, alkenes is the fact that any alkene can technically be a, considered a monomer in an addition polymer reaction, any alkene. So to highlight this, let's look at the simplest alkene, that of ethene.
Ethene is only two carbons with a double bond between them, double covalent bond between them, and we have four hydrogens on there to satisfy the rule of four for each of the carbons. So to set this up, um, I'm going to uh, draw a whole bunch of these ethene molecules in line drawing. Line drawing. So we have these here. It doesn't really, it looks like a bunch of equal signs uh, sort of tipped on their uh, on their axis or something like that, but this uh, sets us up for what a poly, a, an addition polymerization uh, uh, works out to be. So what starts an addition polymer reaction is the addition to the reaction mixture of what's called an initiator. And an initiator uh, is, I, I will be showing this or abbreviate it, uh, will abbreviate it as I star. And it's, the reason I'm abbreviate, abbreviating it is because uh, these molecules are typically very, very complex, much more complex than we want to really uh, work with. And it doesn't really matter because their main purpose is to start an electron cascade between the alkene monomers and which ultimately will form a very long alkane backbone. So notice this, uh, this I star here, we have this, uh, this dotted red line here. This dotted red line means that we're starting to form a covalent bond between, uh, b between the initiator and one carbon of that multiple bond. But that will uh, require the swinging out of one of these multiple bonds on this alkene to bond with a carbon on the next alkene, which swings out its double bond or uh, one of its uh, uh, that double bonds to do the same thing. And so we get this domino effect sort of going where we form, I'll, I'll get to this in just a moment, we form, we see these forming covalent bonds between these two, these carbons on adjacent molecules. It used to be separate monomer molecules, but now we're going to be forming one large molecule. Notably, that carbon-carbon double bond, those original alkenes, goes down to carbon-carbon single bonds. So we end up with this zigzag here. And this zigzag uh, is, is essentially just a single bonded carbon going over and over. Notice, importantly, that I have these squiggle lines here on either side. And what that means is that this, uh, this zigzag goes on for a long, long time, much more than I could put into a slide here, but just to, just to show a representative portion of what that is. Now, this uh, addition, an addition polymer uh, will always have this at its heart, this zigzag that we see here. An addition polymer, when done, always has this single bonded zigzag through any addition polymer. In the case of the addition polymer that we're looking at, uh, this is, uh, that that's the only part of it, that's the only thing associated with it, is just the zigzag. Um, but this creates a material. And since we're starting with ethene, what this ultimately creates, what we see here, is known as polyethene, or if you like, polyethylene. Remember, of, many of us are familiar with the term polyethylene. We said they are, come in these uh, sort of uh, see-through sheets of plastic that we can uh, that we can use to cover up your, your car or your lawnmower or cover up windows. Polyethylene has very high utility here. This particular material. Um, so that this is important. So what we're dealing with here in polymers, when you hear the term polymer, we hear we we, we think of the term plastic. So we're thinking of plastics here. It's another term for plastics. Um, but And polyethylene is certainly a type of plastic. But what would happen now if we had a different type of alkene that, uh, that, that we underwent an addition polymer reaction with? What if we had a substituted alkene? So a substituted alkene, in this case, like... What if, in this case, uh, what we had in this box before was ethene, simple, the simplest, uh, the, the simplest alkene. What if we put on a substituent onto one of the carbons? We take away one of the hydrogens and we put on a substituent. A substituent could be an ethyl group, a methyl group, a phenyl group, maybe a, a, a halogen or something like that. 
Well, it turns out that when we, we have a substitution on, uh, on an alkene, different substitutions produce different, uh, different qualities or physical properties in the polymer that is produced. So let's say we have this particular alkene. We're not going to say for, for certain what that uh, substitution, that R group is, but we're going to do the same thing as we, saw, as we saw before. We're going to put a whole bunch of these together, uh, and we're going to add an initiator, and that initiator is going to start to form a covalent bond with one on one end of one of those uh, on one of those alkenes, and we're as such, as we did before, that's going to form bonds between a domino effect between one molecule and the next molecule, and so on and so forth, uh, taking those all of those double bonds in the alkenes into single bonds to give this general structure right here. Again, with our we're we're book we're bookending these with those squiggle lines to just show a, a portion in there and. So here's the rub, depending on the identity of what we have here in our R groups, it's all the same because we're all working with the same type of monomer throughout, depending on that identity, we're going to get different properties. We're going to have different properties now of the material that's produced. And frequently, if you have a brand new alkene, you don't know what the properties are going to be. When, when you finally make this polymer, you can send it away to be analyzed and, 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 and see how well it extrudes. Is it, is, it a, is it a type of plastic that's very brittle or does it bend or that sort of thing? And you can leverage these physical properties for a particular application, as we'll see in the next slide. So the uses of addition polymers is where this gets very interesting and it shows a practical application to chemistry because chemistry, organic chemistry, what have you, can get dull. Shockingly, it can. Uh, however, this puts a real world application to some of the chemistry we're learning here on paper. Materials chemistry is a huge industry, as we'll see why. Over on the left-hand side, I've got uh, uh, four different alkenes as we can see, and each of these alkenes has a different substitution on it. Three of them have a single substitution, uh, and one of them has, uh, has all four uh, positions substituted. My point is that these are different substitutions. So if we look at, say, our first one, this is a molecule known as styrene. Um, we have a phenyl group up top here. That is our substitution, our phenyl group, but we still have that original alkene on it, as we do with all of these. I'm drawing the, the original alkene on all of these now um, to show that we are indeed starting with an alkene. So what would happen now to my styrene if I made an addition polymer out of it? Well, this is what would come out of it. Again, I'm all, we always have that single zigzag upon which now we have where uh, they were on each of the alkenes, we have our phenyl groups, as shown here. Well, if it starts with styrene is the monomer, polystyrene is the polymer. That's what it's called. I'm not going to hold you to that. But it's also known by the industrial name styrofoam. So it, styrofoam, as we know, has a myriad of uses. Styrofoam containers, like coffee cups, like like, uh, like food dishes or, or what have you. Everybody is familiar with styrofoam, uh, but it, uh, when, we, when we take uh, ethene and put a phenyl group attached to it, well, we get the attributes of styrofoam. If we didn't have the phenyl group on there, we would form polyethylene. Remember from the previous slide? Polyethylene sheets in styrofoam containers are very different. The, the material is very different, and you cannot interchange them. This is what we're leveraging now uh, with these different uses of these polymers based upon the different substitution patterns we see on them. <clears throat> Let's look at the next one. Acrylonitrile. Well, we know, see our alkene, and we have this really weird sort of uh, C triple bond N uh, <clears throat> substitution on it. And if we were to uh, polymerize this particular alkene, well, this is what we'd get, where we get that, that zigzag again, 
with a whole lot of these C triple bond ends, these flags, along for the right. Well, so what? This turns out to be known as polyacrylonitrile, also known by the industrial name Orlon, and you may recognize Orlon as being associated with clothing, Orlon clothing. These, this polymer can be twisted into fibers and sewn into or woven into actual clothing. Again, very different than styrofoam, but that's because these, the monomers that these started with are very different. Looking at the next one, well, here we have an alkene with a chloro substituent, chloroethene. And if we were to polymerize this particular one, we would end up with what is known as polyvinyl chloride, taking the name of PVC. Now, you may have heard the term PVC, such as in PVC piping, that white brittle piping that is, that is used for, uh, for, for many uh, uses. And indeed, PVC is a, is a material used in piping and also in credit cards, or if you like, cat cards. All your, your, the cat cards that you have are all made from the addition polymer polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. So you hold probably in your pocket one of the, uh, the uses of addition polymers. Lastly, this is really weird. Somebody said, all right, let's take an alkene and totally take uh, ethene. We'll take up all of the hydrogens and replace them all with fluorines. So we have this tetrafluoroethene uh, <clears throat> monomer. And if we were to uh, take this and, and uh, form an addition polymer out of it, well, we get the, what in the industry they call Teflon, which is uh, high, known uh, by almost everyone as a non-stick surface on frying pans or what have you. This is a huge uh, application of a, a particular plastic. All of these applications are very different because the material, the, the addition polymer formed between them have very different physical attributes or physical properties. So you can see that um, maybe a reason why that materials chemistry would be very big business uh, and very high uh, application in industrial processes.